Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing anxiety and anxiolytics. Okay, right, so now what we've done is we've discussed six different forms of anxiety disorders, and we've also discussed the physiological fear response. So we've discussed when a bear is about to eat you, what uh, the physiological fear response to that is. Okay, and how it involves the amygdala. Now, in anxiety disorders, the fear response uh, is overactive in some way. Okay, so let's talk about the six different anxiety disorders that uh, we've been talking about and uh, talk about what's happening in terms of the fear response for all six. Okay, so here are the six written out here. So, we'll start with panic disorder. So, in panic disorder, what happens is you are having these panic attacks. Now, the panic attack is just uh, the fear response being initiated. It's a very, very powerful fear response being initiated. And it's being initiated spontaneously. Okay, so the amygdala is initiating fear responses spontaneously to no apparent cues in panic disorder. Okay, so that's what's happening in panic disorder. In post-traumatic stress disorder, remember what you have is those exaggerated startle responses. Okay, now startle responses are little fear responses. Okay, so it appears that uh, maybe the um, fear response is slightly exaggerated in people with post-traumatic stress disorder so that when a cue does come in that should produce a fear response, okay, such as the startle response, it produces a slightly too big fear response, okay, and obviously there are other components of post-traumatic stress disorder, such as the reliving of the terrible experiences and also the emotional numbness that that theory doesn't explain, but that's uh, the involvement of the amygdala in post-traumatic stress disorder. In generalised anxiety disorder, and I should probably just say that all of this is quite wishy-washy, okay? Uh, it's the models that we have at the moment. Our understanding of all neuropsychiatric disorders leaves somewhat to be desired, okay? But I'm presenting to you what is uh, understood as, it's, as we stand. Okay, so, uh, generalised anxiety disorder, GAD, okay, in generalised anxiety disorder, the idea is that the fear response is just chronically on at a low level, basically, and that's why these people are continuously on edge, basically. In social anxiety disorder, whenever you're in social context, you're initiating minor fear responses and you know uh, when you're in a performance situation when you're about to perform in front of someone then some people with social anxiety disorder that have it quite severely some of them can initiate full-on uh, fear responses full-on panic attacks in response to having to perform in front of people okay so it's the fear response being initiated to uh, social situations Simple phobias, that's when you have some phobic object which is then initiating uh, a powerful fear response uh, to that. Okay, so maybe a dog is initiating the fear response rather than a bear now, or a spider is initiating the same fear response as a bear should initiate. Okay, so the fear response is absolutely fine, it's just being initiated to something that really doesn't deserve being it being initiated to. And then obsessive compulsive disorder, okay, uh, that, remember, the obsessions are generally worried obsessions, so that that's where the, uh, potentially, the anxiety component comes in, that maybe in the obsession, the fear response is being initiated uh, in that. Okay, right, uh, but as we discussed earlier, potentially obsessive compulsive disorder is the odd one out here. Okay, right. So now what we're going to do is discuss the anxiolytic drugs. Okay, now the first anxiolytics that we are going to discuss were actually discovered and first marketed as antidepressants. Okay, and even to this day they are far more famous as antidepressants than as anxiolytics. Okay, so we're going to discuss three categories of antidepressants, uh, namely the SSRIs, the SNRIs and the tricyclic antidepressants. But before we discuss uh, the antidepressant drugs, what I firstly want to make sure everyone is familiar with is the monoamine systems in the brain, because these antidepressants are all going to affect the monoamine systems of the brain. 
Okay, so firstly I'm going to tell you about the monoamines, okay, uh, which are three very important neurotransmitters in the brain. And then I'm going to tell you about uh, the function that they perform in the brain and the setup that we have in the brain. Okay, so let's start off with what the three monoamines then are. So we'll start off with the first one that's going to be extremely important since we're discussing antidepressants. Okay, and the first one I'm going to discuss is serotonin. Now, serotonin has a um, other name which is often used, uh, which is 5-hydroxytryptamine. And this is uh, a more useful name because it tells you more about the structure of this molecule than does the name serotonin. Okay, and for short, 5-hydroxytryptamine is often abbreviated to 5-HT. Okay, right. So I want to show you the structure of uh, serotonin or 5-hydroxytryptamine. Okay, now, it is derived from an amino acid, okay, so a proteinergic amino acid that is used in proteins. Specifically, it's derived from the amino acid tryptophan. Okay, so we're going to start off by drawing the structure of tryptophan, then we'll see the structure of tryptamine, and then we'll progress to 5-hydroxytryptamine. Okay, right. Now, before we can discuss the structure of tryptophan, however, I firstly want to describe what an indole ring is. And before I can describe what the structure of an indole ring is, I need to start off with the structure of a pyrrole ring. So I'm going to start off with describing what a pyrrole ring is, and then we'll progress up to an indole ring, and then on to tryptophan. Okay, so, uh, I will show this in skeletal formula. Okay, so remember in skeletal formulae, you do not show carbon atoms. Carbon atoms are going to be implicitly shown by corners, okay? Uh, you also do not show hydrogen atoms coming off carbon atoms, okay? When there's a missing bond uh, off a carbon atom, it's implicitly assumed uh, that that is to a hydrogen atom. Okay, so this is the structure of a pyrrole ring then. Firstly, it's a five-membered ring, okay, where the, one of the members is a nitrogen atom up here, okay, and the other four members of the ring are carbon atoms and are therefore just being shown as corners here. So here we have four carbon atoms. Okay, now we're going to have two double bonds, with a double bond there and a double bond there, okay? And then off this nitrogen, you're also going to have a hydrogen. Now, off all four of the carbons, you can see that there is a missing bond. Carbon needs four bonds. Each of these four carbon atoms only has three bonds. Okay, but the final bond will be to a hydrogen atom, so I don't have to show it. Okay, so this is the structure then of a pyrrole ring. Okay, and we're going to have one of these structures within tryptophan. Okay, now what I want to go up to is the structure of an indole ring, because actually tryptophan is going to contain an indole ring, but an indole ring contains a pyrrole ring, so tryptophan therefore does contain a pyrrole ring. Okay, so, what I'm going to start off with is just redrawing out my pyrrole ring, so here is my nitrogen atom, here are my four carbon atoms, okay, we'll have the hydrogen coming off the nitrogen here, we'll have a double bond here, a double bond here, Okay, and then I'm going to put a benzene ring attached to the side of this. So off each of these carbons here, we're taking those hydrogens off them. Remember, originally in the pyrrole ring, this carbon and this carbon had a hydrogen coming off them. Okay, we're taking those off, and we're now attaching an additional ring here. So we've got four additional carbons put in, and we're going to have a benzene ring, so we're going to have alternating double and single bonds in this six-membered ring here. And each of these four carbons here will then have a hydrogen coming off, which isn't shown. Okay, so this then is the structure of an indole ring, and the amino acid now, tryptophan, is going to contain one of these indole rings. Okay, right, so let's now show tryptophan. So, we'll start off by drawing the core amino acid structure. So here's the amino group, okay, here is the alpha carbon with the hydrogen coming off, okay, and here's the carboxylic acid group, okay, so that's the core generic amino acid structure that all proteinergic amino acids have, okay, and now the R group of tryptophan consists of a methylene group, like so, 
and then we're going to have the indole ring and I'm going to show the indole ring still in the skeletal formula and I know I've been using molecular formula here but I'm about to now switch to using skeletal formula okay it will make the picture look simpler okay I know I'm not sticking to hard and fast rules here but the fundamental aim of skeletal formulae is to try and make things look simpler okay I think that amino acids look simpler in the molecular form but this certainly looks simpler in the skeletal form the indole ring it looks horrible if you draw it in the molecular form. So I'm now going to put it in in the skeletal form here. Okay, so here is our pyrrole ring. Whoops, and I haven't actually told you where I'm going to stick it onto. I'm going to stick the indole ring onto this methylene group and I'm going to use this carbon here. I'm going to take the hydrogen off that carbon and then I'm going to bind it to this carbon here. Okay, so here is my pyrrole ring of the indole ring here. And then I've got my benzene that comes off the pyrrole ring here. So now let's put in the double bonds, there's a double bond, there's a double bond, and there's a double bond. And off this nitrogen, you're going to have a hydrogen. Okay, so that's the amino acid tryptophan. Okay, but we're not interested in the amino acid tryptophan. We want serotonin. We want 5-hydroxytryptamine. Okay, so first thing I need to tell you how you turn tryptophan into tryptamine here. Okay, and then I need to tell you where the fifth... Um, well, where number five is, and where, and therefore where we're going to add the hydroxy group onto. Okay, so firstly, how do you turn tryptophan into tryptamine? Okay, well, basically, to turn tryptophan into tryptamine, you take off the carboxylic acid group here. Okay, you remove this and replace it with a hydrogen coming off that carbon there. Okay, and that creates a tryptamine. Okay, now 5-hydroxytryptamine, all we now need to do is add on an alcohol group, a hydroxy group somewhere. Okay, so to do this, you need to know how the uh, members of this structure are labelled. Okay, so let me tell you something about the labelling of the carbons in this structure. Okay, so this first carbon here, that's just off the carboxylic acid group, this is known as the alpha carbon. Okay, and both tryptophan and tryptamine, this is the case. Okay, um, and then this methylene group here, the carbon of that is known as the beta carbon. So you have the alpha carbon and the beta carbon. Then the carbons in this indole ring, those are named in a completely different way to the naming of these two carbons here. So to name the members of the ring, what you do is you start with the nitrogen here, and you name that number one. Okay, then you go round. You go to this member here, you go call that number two. You go here, you call that number three. And you might say, well, this one's number four now. It's not number four, okay? Uh, someone long ago decided that when uh, you have a carbon like so that's sitting in between two rings, it should not be given its own number, basically. Instead, this is now called 3A, okay? So because it's after number three here, it's called 3A. Okay, then this one here is called number four. Okay, this one up here is called number five. This one here is called six, seven. This one again, it's in between two rings, so it's not given its own number, it's called seven A. Okay, right, so I hope that's clear. Right, uh, so this is number five up here. So we're going to stick an alcohol group off that carbon there, and I'm sorry this picture's a little small, I wish I'd drawn it a bit bigger. Okay, uh, and that will create us 5-hydroxytryptamine. So let's now draw the full structure nice and finished. Okay, so I'll try and draw it as much as possible uh, so that it's in the same position as this drawing here. Okay, so here's the alpha carbon here. Now we've replaced the carboxylic acid group here with a hydrogen to create tryptamine. Okay. Then we've got our methylene group here, okay, and now let's put the indole ring on here. Okay, so here's the nitrogen right at the front here, okay, and then here's the hydrogen off the nitrogen. Double bond here, double bond here, and then we've got the benzene ring here. Okay, double bond there, double bond there. And then we've got an alcohol group here, coming off that fifth carbon now, so this is number five here. Okay, right, uh, so that then is the structure of 5-hydroxytryptamine, serotonin, 5-HT. And you will notice that it only has a single amino group, okay, so you've got one amino group here. And that's why this is known as a monoamine, okay, uh, because it's got a single amine group. 
So that's the first monoamine that's going to be important. Okay, um, I'm now going to discuss another monoamine that isn't really going to be that important to us when we're discussing the antidepressants, but I'm going to draw it out because it is a very important monoamine in the brain, and also its structure will help us understand another monoamine which we do need to understand in order to understand depression. So the two other monoamines that are really important in the brain are dopamine and noradrenaline. Okay, I'm going to start off by drawing the structure of dopamine. We're not really going to talk that much about dopamine for depression. Okay, uh, it's very important in schizophrenia and also in drug addiction, uh, but it's not too important in depression not compared to serotonin and noradrenaline but we're going to put it here for completion and also because noradrenaline is basically just dopamine with something added on so it will help us uh, understand noradrenaline okay so we'll start off then with dopamine okay so dopamine then uh, dopamine is also derived from the amino acid it's derived from the amino acid tyrosine Okay, so I'll try, uh, well, I'll start by drawing out the amino acid tyrosine, and then I'll show you how we're going to modify tyrosine uh, to produce dopamine. So at the moment, I'm not drawing out dopamine, I'm drawing out tyrosine. So here's the amino group, here's the alpha carbon, here's the carboxylic acid group, whoops, here, okay. And now the R group of tyrosine consists of a methylene group, like so, then with a benzene ring coming off here, Okay, so this six-membered carbon ring with alternating double and single bonds, and then an alcohol group coming off the benzene ring here. So this is the structure of the amino acid tyrosine. Okay, and this is what uh, the body uses to create dopamine. Okay, so how do you convert this then into dopamine? Well, what you firstly do is you take off the carboxylic acid group. So very similar to what we did in tryptophan, in fact. Okay, so we're going to take off the carboxylic acid group here. This is actually the second modification we make. I should actually do it in the order the body does them. Okay, so forget this for the moment. Imagine the carboxylic acid groups there. The first modification you're going to make is you're actually going to stick another alcohol group onto this carbon here. Okay, so that carbon had a hydrogen coming off it. You're going to stick an alcohol group on there. So in fact, it's very, very similar to what you're going to do to tryptophan. You're going to stick an alcohol group off, on rather, and take a carboxylic acid group off. So firstly, you stick the alcohol group on, and then you remove the carboxylic acid group and replace that with a hydrogen atom, and that gives you dopamine. Okay, so let's draw this out here, next to dopamine where I've written it. So here's the amino group, okay, here's the alpha carbon with a hydrogen coming off it, and now another hydrogen coming off it, uh, replacing the carboxylic acid group. Here is the methylene group here, and now you've got a benzene ring here, okay, which has got two alcohol groups coming off. Now there is a special name for a benzene ring which has two alcohol groups coming off it. So when you've got a benzene ring with two alcohol groups coming off it like so, this is known as a catechol ring. Okay, uh, so that's why dopamine and also noradrenaline, which also contain cate a catechol ring, and adrenaline in fact, uh, they're all known as catecholamines. Okay, because they have a catechol ring within them, and they also have an amine group in, okay, here. But they're also called monoamines because uh, they have just a single amine group. So this then, here, this is the structure of dopamine here. Okay, right. Now, to convert dopamine into noradrenaline, it's, again, a single conversion that we need to do. And noradrenaline is the other monoamine that's very important in the brain. We're not going to need adrenaline at all. Adrenaline is not so important in the brain, but noradrenaline is important. Okay, uh, so uh, noradrenaline, uh, to convert dopamine into noradrenaline, what you do is you remove this hydrogen atom off this carbon here. Oh, can you replace that with an alcohol group? Okay, so let me draw this. Where should I put it? I'll try and squeeze it in here. So here is the amino group. Okay, and this is why it's called a monoamine, because it's still got this single amino group here. Here's the alpha carbon with two hydrogens coming off it. Okay, now we've got this carbon here 
with a hydrogen coming off it and now an alcohol group coming off there and then we've got the catechol ring okay so once again noradrenaline is a monoamine or you could also call it a catecholamine because you've got a catechol ring with a single amino group in that molecule as well okay so that's then the structure of noradrenaline now the two key uh, monoamines that are going to be key uh, to how the antidepressants work are serotonin and noradrenaline. So those are the two we're going to need. But dopamine, uh, the dopamine system in the brain follows much the same principles as the serotonin system and the noradrenaline uh, system. So we might as well uh, discuss it as well just to have a complete picture of the monoamine systems within the brain. Okay, right. So, what are these neurotransmitters used for then in the brain? Because they are neurotransmitters. However, they're not your sort of classical idea of a neurotransmitter. And let me explain what I mean by that. So, the sort of classical idea of a neurotransmitter can be represented by this picture here. Okay, here is our presynaptic neuron. Okay, so this is the axon terminal of some neuron within the brain. Okay, and the idea is that it will then synapse onto some dendritic spine of the postsynaptic neuron. So this is our postsynaptic neuron. And the idea is that when the presynaptic neuron fires an action potential, so let's say some action potential is arriving down the axon uh, and arriving in the axon terminal here, okay, that that will then trigger the release of neurotransmitter from the presynaptic neuron. The neurotransmitter will go over, act on receptors on the surface of the postsynaptic neuron, and cause some sort of response in the postsynaptic neuron, okay, that will uh, either make this postsynaptic neuron more likely to fire an action potential, or make it less likely to fire an action potential, depending on whether the neurotransmitter that we're releasing here is an inhibitory neurotransmitter or an activatory neurotransmitter. NT is just short for neurotransmitter. And the two major neurotransmitters like this in the brain are glutamate, that's the major excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain. So when you release glutamate onto a postsynaptic neuron, it makes that postsynaptic neuron more likely to fire an action potential. And the key inhibitory one, which we're actually going to talk about very much so later when we come on to the benzodiazepines, is GABA, gamma amino butyric acid. Okay, when you release that onto neurons, it makes them less likely to fire action potentials. Okay, right. Uh, so, um, those are the sort of classical neurotransmitters, okay? The monoamines in the brain do not work like that. Instead, what happens is, if I draw a little picture of the brain, okay, if I have my picture of the brain here, you have special um, clusters of neurons at very special locations in the brain that can release these neurotransmitters. Most neurons in the brain cannot release serotonin, dopamine, or noradrenaline. Okay, but there are special locations, and I'll tell you these special locations in a moment, okay, where there are neurons which make these neurotransmitters and can release them. Now, these special locations, and let me just uh, they're in the brain stem. In fact, I think it would probably be best if I tell you where these special locations are so that I can then at least point to something. So, if we have our uh, brain here, so we'll start with where serotonin is produced. Well, serotonin, there are absolutely loads of little clusters of neurons which can release serotonin and they're positioned all over the place in the brain stem, mainly in the ponds, okay? so. Instead of actually showing you every single last one of these, I'm just going to put a sort of big area here. And what this means is that there are loads of little areas in the brain stem, okay, which can release uh, serotonin. Okay, and these nuclei are all known as the Raffe nuclei. Okay, but there are loads of them. Okay, they're dotted all over the brain stem. There's not one massive one like I've shown here, but that gets the point across that they're in the brainstem basically. Okay, so in the brainstem you have lots of little points. In fact, it would have probably been better if I'd sort of put dots basically, maybe. Okay, like so. Uh, so there are loads of these little nuclei dotted around the brainstem uh, which can uh, produce serotonin and then can release it. Okay, um, so we'll use those as the examples. And then what happens is these uh, neurons in these Raffe nuclei they send their axons all over the brain. So they'll send axons all over the place. Different neurons will have axons going to different portions of the brain. 
okay, and they will release serotonin all over the brain, okay, and the serotonin then acts on loads of different neurons. They, these neurons that are releasing the serotonin, they are not involved in classical synapses like this. They're not going to, um, you know, join on to another neuron's dendritic spine and then release the neurotransmitter onto that dendritic spine. They just release the serotonin into the general medium. Okay, so serotonin has a modulatory function on loads of different neurons. Okay, so the Raffae nuclei, they're continuously releasing serotonin into the brain and it's just going into the extracellular fluid of the brain and it works on all of the neurons in the brain. Okay, it changes the function of all of them. It is not involved in classical synapses like this. Instead what you have, if I get another piece of paper, oh I'll need another piece, yeah. Okay, instead what you have is basically just endings, okay, and then you don't have a postsynaptic neuron. So this is our serotonergic neuron here. Okay, and that just means a neuron which releases serotonin. Okay, uh, this is the serotonergic neuron axon terminal, which is going to be releasing serotonin, but it doesn't have a postsynaptic neuron. Okay, it's just releasing the serotonin into the extracellular fluid, and this will now go off and bind to receptors on loads of different neurons. So it has broad regulatory functions on the entire brain, okay? And serotonin is very uh, involved in controlling your mood, okay? Your mood status, okay? And things like that. And in fact, that's the case for all of the monoamines, that their role is in regulation like this. They're not involved in classical synapses. Instead, they're involved in regulating the function of the entire brain, basically. Okay, right. So now all I need to tell you is where the specific uh, places that release dopamine and noradrenaline are. Okay, so dopamine and noradrenaline are slightly more simple than um, serotonin. Serotonin had all of these raphe nuclei dotted all over the place in the brainstem. Okay, dopamine has one nice location which uh, ha contains neurons which can produce it and then release it into all different portions of the brain. Okay, and this one little location is known as the ventral tegmental area. Okay, so I'm going to show you this now. So, the ventral tegmental area is in the midbrain, so we're going to go back now to the midbrain. And by the way, the ventral tegmental area is often abbreviated as the VTA. So let me just remind you what the midbrain was. Okay, where are my pictures? So, back to our picture of the brainstem. This was the midbrain here, and here's a nice picture of the midbrain here. Okay, I'll redraw this out. Okay, so for the ventral tegmental area, so we'll draw out the midbrain. So the Mickey Mouse or the pig-like structure here. So here's the back of the midbrain. And by the way, these little swellings on the back, these are known as the colliculi. Okay. And then we've got the processes going forward here, like so. Right, so let me put on some landmarks then. So once again, we'll have the periaqueduct or grey here with the cerebroaqueduct running through it. We've then got uh, the uh, red nuclei here. Now the ventral tegmental area sits right in the middle, here, basically. Okay, so you have one ventral tegmental area, because it's right in the midline. Okay, so the VTA is this portion here. Okay, and this contains dopaminergic neurons which can release, well, which can send their axons all over the brain. Okay, so different neurons in this ventral tegmental area will be sending their axons to very different locations, and they can release dopamine onto that portion of the brain, and this dopamine can change uh, the overall activity of that portion of the brain, okay? Uh, so again, dopamine has a very broad regulatory function. Okay, so uh, that's the ventral tegmental area, and you know, at different places, dopamine will have all sorts of different effects, and another important thing to say is that, you know, it's not a case that you just activate the ventral tegmental area all at once and then you get dopamine released everywhere in the brain. If you activate different portions of it, you'll get dopamine released in different places in the brain, okay? And dopamine at different places in the brain serves different functions and will change the function of the brain in different ways. 
Okay, so these are very, very important uh, at regulating the function of the brain. Uh, now, finally, noradrenaline. Okay, so noradrenaline, the places which regulate the, well, sorry, the places which produce and then release noradrenaline uh, are in the ponds. Okay, so if I get my picture of the ponds back again, here is the ponds here. Okay, the portion underneath the midbrain but above the medulla. Okay, right. Now, let me give you a little bit more information about the ponds. If I draw the ponds here, okay, once again, so here's is the ponds, and then below the ponds you have the medulla, like so, and then below the medulla you then have the spinal cord. Okay, now, remember that behind um, the brain stem you have the cerebellum. Now, the ponds has uh, cerebellar peduncles, okay, so it has connections to the cerebellum, which I'll show here, which aren't going to be important functionally for what we're discussing, uh, but are important anatomically in understanding where the location of these um, noradrenaline secreting neurons is. Okay, so these are these projections of the pons backwards, which are then going to connect into the cerebellum, which is here. Okay, and you have two of these connections, and I've tried to show that here. You have a um, left one here and a right one here. And these are known as the middle cerebellar peduncles. Okay, so you have a superior cerebellar peduncle that's higher up, where you have two of them, a left one and a right one. And then you have an inferior cerebellar peduncle, which are lower down at the level of the medulla. So these ones that are right in the middle of the pons, these are known as the middle cerebellar peduncles. Okay, right. So, if we now want to show uh, where uh, these special neurons which release noradrenaline are, what we're going to do is we're going to take a cross-section of the pons at around this level, and we will see the cerebellar peduncles, basically. We'll see the middle cerebellar peduncles. Okay, so when we do this, we'll get a picture that looks kind of like this. So this is the front of the pons here. Okay, so let's get a bit of colour on this diagram here. So in green... This is the pons here. Okay, and at present we're looking at the front of the pons. Okay, so we're looking at the portion here at the moment. So this is the front of the pons. Okay, and then towards the back, what you're going to have is these cerebellar peduncles, uh, like so. Okay, stretching off from the back of the pons, like so. Okay, and basically. The areas which secrete noradrenaline can be found near the back of the pons on either side. So you have a left one and a right one. Now, what are these areas known as? They're called the locus cerulius. Okay, cerulius. Uh, and it's spelt weirdly, it's cerulius. But it's pronounced cerulius, but that's not me there. So, locus cerulius. Okay, and you've got two loci cerulei, I don't know if that's the plural. Um, so you've got a right locus cerulius and a left locus cerulius. Okay, so again, these areas are full of neurons uh, which can produce and secrete noradrenaline, and they're going to send their axons all over the brain, and at different places the noradrenaline will have different regulatory functions, and therefore these little systems are capable of altering the function of the entire brain, and that's very important to understand. So these three systems collectively are known as the monoamine systems. And our antidepressant drugs are going to work by interfering with these uh, monoamine systems. At least this is what our understanding of how they work. It might be that the way that these drugs actually help in anxiety is completely different and we are completely clueless. Okay, but our understanding of how they work involves changes to these monoamine systems. How changes to the monoamine system then helps with the anxiety, we don't know. Potentially, the monoamine systems are, are sending neurons into the amygdala, and then by changing the monoamine system, we change the function of the amygdala. But, you know, it's very wishy-washy. Okay, right. So, I think we'll call it there for this video. And then in the next video, what we'll do is we'll start discussing the different types of uh, antidepressants and exactly what they are going to do to alter the monoamine systems.